Without further ado, here's just my husband. He used to do maritime security, and he's telling me just to scoot over. So I'm going to do that, and he's going to join. And hopefully our producer will not wake up from her nap. Hopefully not. Okay, so I'm just showing hey, people the ship right now. Let me get real nice and close <laughs> and cozy in here. Wow. It's not that kind of channel. This is date folks, night. It is. This is our date night. Do you have your, <laughs> your chats up, by the way? Yeah, but I was just showing people what the ship looked like in case they, they hadn't seen. Yeah. And um, Well, so just a little bit of information I can give you. So these ships, so these are container ships. It's, it's called multimodal. Um, they use those big, uh, we also call them mill vans or connex boxes, and they come in several different shapes and sizes. They're all pretty much standard, but the lengths are what's differentiated in them. So you have anywhere from like a 10 foot container to a 40 foot container. Um, and I think even now they're getting a little bit uh, bigger than that. But um, this particular vessel is about 400 meters long. So it's huge. Um, in the draft, so for, not to insult anybody's intelligence, but the draft on these types of ships, when they're fully loaded, can be up to about 45 feet. Uh, so almost 50 feet deep. Um, the reason why that's an issue with regards to the Suez, and this is at the southern end of the Suez, by the way. So there's a couple parts within the Suez. Um, oh, that that's very significant there. I'll, I'll talk about that here okay, in a minute, just, all those I'll tugs. Back. Yeah, leave it right there. Um, so what's significant about that is the Suez at its max depth is about 79 feet. It, so it doesn't even clear 100 feet. So when these... Um, something like this happens it, it's it's a big deal uh and over a third of the of of the vessel is potentially stuck on on the side of it so they're trying to use all these tugs to uh push it or move it but the, the problem is is it becomes a physics question at that point and i read somewhere that it would take there there's one ship in particular that can pull about 670 tons and they did the math it would take about 60 of those ships and that ship is, there's only one in the world like that. Uh, so what's significant about that is that because of the way the fluid dynamics work with everything in these tugs, even if they had a whole string of tugs pulling this thing, the, the effect w could or would be, instead of actually moving or pushing the ship, is it actually just starts moving the water, which is why they're having such a hard time. And they're also having a hard time trying to dig it out. Like somebody made the joke on... I don't know if it was Fox News or MSNBC or whoever, but they were talking about like, oh, well, really? They got a bulldozer trying to pull it or move it, and no, that that um, that thing was actually just trying to dig out the bow of the ship to see if they can get it moved. More than likely, what's going to have to happen is they're going to have to unload uh, all the containers from it to try to lighten that load a little bit to see if they can then pull it because uh, it's got a significant amount of weight in it. So what you see there with those four tugs what they're probably trying to hope to do is like by rocking it and and trying to change the angle of it maybe it can get the it's uh that bulbous plane of that bowel uh off the side but it's it's just not working and it's pretty significant because the amount of traffic that goes through the suez every year is about eighteen thousand ships pass through there it's a major um major uh, high-speed avenue of approach is what we would call it. And it connects, you know, the bulk, like the Mediterranean uh, in, in Europe with uh, the Indian Ocean and the rest of Southeast Asia. So there, there's a lot of, probably majority of the things that you see on your shelves that come from overseas uh, probably come through the Suez Canal. Uh, I remember when I was in the Marine Corps, because I've, I've crossed through the Suez Canal, I believe, about six times. Um, and quite a few of those times that, you know, I would have to stand watch on on, on the ship as, as a scout sniper just because of how close proximity our boats were to both sides of those shores. Uh, so you make yourself a bit of a hard target. And um, so I just thought... Um, some things would be in, I, I'm curious to see what's going to come out of all this. I'm sure there's going to be a, an investigation. Uh, when I left the Marine Corps, one of the things that I did was I was a privately contracted uh, maritime security uh, manager. So I was qualified under 
uh, Solus, the Coast Guard, Det Nor Norte Veritas, uh, uh, as a company security officer, ship and vessel security officer, and a facility security officer. So those are certain qualifications that you have to have in order to provide security in a maritime environment, both in ports and facilities as well as ships and vessels. Uh, so there's a lot there's a lot involved in that. Uh, that was at the height of uh, piracy and kidnap and ransom that was taking place uh, both on, on the east and west coast of Africa. Uh, so in the in what qualified me for that was when I was in the Marine Corps, we would, uh, as, as reconnaissance Marines, we, we had other qualifications that we'd have to do under uh, Marine Expeditionary Unit Special Operations Capable, and that was VBSS, which is Visit Board Search and Seizure. Uh, so you, you probably have seen things like uh, the Magellan Star, that was a force recon platoon that liberated that ship when it got taken over by pirates. There was also, uh, everybody's seen Captain Phillips, so I believe that was in Marisk, Alabama. Um, so I, I think it's, you know, the thing that, that would be a concern there is given the impact on all that traffic is that they're probably going to want to try to figure out, like, is the, was there some kind of intent? Because this is a pretty significant mess up. Um, I, I don't, I don't think I've ever seen or heard of anything happening in the Suez to this degree, as far as like completely, totally blocking traffic. So uh, for me in my brain, like I, I'm, I'm kind of curious to see w what's going to come out of all that because on the outside, it can seem very insignificant, but that's the same thing that, um, happened with the, uh, uh, now the name's escaping me. I can't believe why it would be, but uh, so when you look at the the, the bombing for the USS Cole, uh, what specifically took place with that? That was an interesting situation where uh, the movement of ships and shipping got manipulated. Uh, that ship was actually manipulated to pull in face first, in, you know, n nosing in. Norm normal. SOPs for naval vessels is to what we call combat park into uh, a port because the biggest threat that's going to happen for the ship is coming into a port because the ship can't exactly like drive on land, right? So even if a ship gets attacked from the land by being nose out, it can have a quicker egress to get out of a port. Well, the coal was actually made to come in face first because uh, that's a whole nother long story. The, the port master was involved in it, but it, it later was found out that the USS Cole wasn't the initial first target. The actual initial first target was uh, USS the Sullivans. USS the Sullivans was named after the five Sullivan brothers who were killed in 1942 uh, on, on the USS Juno, uh, and it was a message. The, me the message was from Al-Qaeda is that, you know, we will not only go after you, but we will remove all of your generations from the face of the earth. So when you're looking at things like exploitation uh, of a uh, potential target, uh, things like that are, are actually very important. Um, just like uh, Bin Laden once said, you have the watches, we have the time. Uh, what, what he was alluding to is tactical patience. You have all the technology but we will still have an effect on you and you will utilize tactical patience and we will wait you out. Um, um, no Name says, Lynn, I was on an MEP ship that was attempted piracy off Somalia. Fun story of attack, wrong ship. Yeah. Uh, Gordon, my best mate, ran an oil tanker into a sandbank first time he was pilot. And Bobby says, is it bigger or less than Titanic? Do you know the answer to that? No, I don't know the answer to that one, Bobby. But uh, No Name, that that's definitely an interesting story. Uh yeah, looking at the the pirate that that was one of the fun things as far as being on a boat um, and doing maritime security is you know there's very specific pirate behaviors that we you would look for. Uh, they have dows and, and motherships and things like that and did play you, hooks and ladders. So it's pretty. Did you already talk about what's in like cars and usually usually it's cars batteries um, i just saw one report said stuff like that like lithium ion batteries for electric cars yeah well and the reason why so the reason when when that type of shipping uh really gained um really 
like started it, it became uh, s such an important mode of shipping because those container boxes they could come right off a ship very quickly go right onto a semi trailer or in into rail shipping so it is very fast uh, moving bulk shipping that way um, so at any rate uh, yeah it, it could be any number of things in in those boxes everything from agriculture items uh, to uh, cars to other called break bulk um, well and that was interesting because didn't you do that story on in um, Western Washington about all the apples remember yeah. they had to take them off the ship and yeah there was a labor strike at the port and so they couldn't ship out the apples that go to China which buys a lot of Washington's apples and then I think we import apples which is so stupid but um anyway <laughs> That's how it works, I guess, in agriculture. Um, so I did this story because I found I got a tip that these apple growers were basically dumping their apples, which is it's a real travesty. They were dumping their apples by the truckload in this sort of private, um, in the middle of nowhere property by the Columbia River. And uh, this photographer and I went, and first off, it was funny because he's really scared of rats. And there were definitely, um, I, I remember saying, watch out for a rat. And he literally squealed like a little, little <laughs> child and ran off. And, um, you know, that was actually my story quite a bit when I was, you know, no offense to photojournalists, but, uh, there were a few guys that I worked with that are like one time I had to go to a coyote den guy was totally freaked out. And I was just like, come on guys, suck it up. Um, but, uh, yeah, uh, that was interesting because that, that did not make people very happy when they saw those apples being dumped. And one interesting little factoid about that was that there are rules. You can't sell your, or even give away your stuff to food banks for, for, you know, they're past a certain date or whatever, even if they're perfectly fine or they don't look a certain way, the grocery stores locally won't take them. And, you know, so there's, this, there's all these rules about selling your agriculture that a lot of farmers don't like. Actually, one of my favorite books by uh, Joel Salatin, you guys may know of him, Polyface Farms. Um, in, in the Shenandoah Valley, I believe is where he is in Virginia. One of my favorite books of his is everything I want to do is illegal. And he's like, <laughs> you know, he's, he's one of the primo farmers that I follow in, in the country. Um, you know, is one of those regenerative guys who, uh, he, like he says, the pigs express their pigness and the cows express their cowness and the chickens express their chickenness. And, you know, and, um, I want to, I would say that like my, if I ever farmed animals, I would call it one bad day farm. Uh, where it's just like one bad day. Um, we're all, we all have that, that bad day. Unfortunately, we just went through it with our dog. Um, but one, one bad day farm where the animals live the way that animals are supposed to live. And then they have the one bad day at the end. Um, but Joel Salatin's kind of one of those guys, but anyway, he, yeah, his book, Did everything I want to do. Huh? Did you just come up? With I've that? thought about it for a while, but I just announced it here. So it's copyrighted wow. now. Um, <laughs> but anyway, but okay. yeah, he, he, everything I want to do is illegal is a really good book. If you're ever interested in that, especially how small farmers are getting weeded out. Um, okay. Lynn is going to go to the chat, but you have to pull up the, you have to put it on chat. Yeah, no, I understand. Okay. I, I cleared it. I put this together. Remember? I okay. know how to use this. <laughs> so, um, no, I just want to hit this one right here. So Matt, USS Cole attack was rather amateuristic. I, I would actually argue, uh, that point with you, uh, just because of the fact that they, they were a able to. Uh, get the ship to move into the port the way that they wanted it uh, and be uh, they used urban masking and, and social camouflage to proximately get themselves closer to the ship uh, that Dow was fully loaded with explosives and the other effect that it had by having the ship uh, ported the way it was is the for those who've never been on a ship before when a ship comes into port you have what's called a quarter deck and there's there's either side of the ship can you can put the quarter deck uh, up up against the uh, the port of call for the dock. However, uh, both quarter decks lead into usually the uh, mess decks, and then nearby the mess decks is usually where uh, medical is at. Uh, those two areas on the ship, because the mess decks are also commonly used as an area where you you'll do like surge troop birthing. Uh, but with those quarter decks, what'll happen is th they'll bring uh, local vendors into the mess decks so that they can sell their wares and, and so on and so forth. So th the point is, is during that time frame when the ship is ported, those are the most popular populated areas of the ship because people are moving in and out of the ship. And where that bomb was, where that ship 
specifically went up to the side of the of, of the boat, uh, th that's where the explosion occurred, and it, it had the maximum of, amount of casualties on the USS Cole that that it could have had given the size of the attack, uh, and it came damn near close to sinking it, uh, just because of where the explosion took place. And it's it's rumored, you know, one of the questions was, you know, hey, the reason why the attack didn't go on the Sullivans is because of the tides and the boat that had the explosives was so overladen that it, it couldn't make it there. Or, you know, there's a couple other reasons why, but that was the original, it was found out that was the original intended target. And so, but the point was, is that, yeah, they were, they were able to using simple uh, psychological, uh, dis psychologically disarming behaviors to close that proximity because in no other situation, no other case would another vessel be allowed to get that close to a U.S. warship in a port of call. So I, I would say that, you know, they, they did a pretty good job attacking it um, to uh, achieve what they needed to achieve. Well, one thing about, and this is just, this is just me kind of spitballing here. Um, you know, there have been times covering corporations, for instance, as an environmental reporter where they blame mother nature. Cause I saw somebody said something about, um, high winds or something like that. And, and that's been blamed for a couple of failures of, of significance, um, that I've covered that have led to some pretty bad problems. But what we found out really was that, and I'm not saying that this definitely happened in this case, but what we found out was that there are structural integrity issues that, preceded that, that if you had had, you know, say you had kept up on your safety protocol, um, you know, you weren't cutting corners with making sure your operation was <laughs> running smoothly, um, that you probably wouldn't have had this disaster. And I don't know if that, that happened in this case, but you know, you'll hear things like it was the wind from the company or it was the, this, the tides or, you know, and you have to always then ask the second question. Okay. But uh, could could a different ship have or whatever else could a different this or that you know done differently? Would it have, did it have to lead to this just because of the wind? Because because certainly as an environmental reporter, corporations constantly would would try to say you know Mother Nature did it well, when it really wasn't Mother Nature. It was well, that they were cutting corners. I would say the question is is if wind is what pushed that ship into the side blocking the Suez the way it did, then how was it the other forty nine ships that are going through there per day? Because, like I said, eighteen thousand ships move through the Suez a year, um, and I I don't know. I'm just curious. I, I, I what's the what are the odds that it would happen at that point in time in the Suez? Because in the northern part of the Suez, there's actually two canals. So if it had happened up in the northern most northern part, it, it it wouldn't have been an issue. They could have just used the other canal. Whereas in the southern part, there's only one baby, and and that blocks it up. And so Courtney Grace asked Lynn, if the cargo ship blocking the Suez was deliberate, what are the implications of that? And the most likely reason to cut off access to the Suez. Well, uh, like I said, the Suez opens up into the Indian Ocean and to the Persian Gulf, and so uh, that can do a bunch of different things. One, it can prevent uh, any of the naval amphibious readiness groups. They're called ARGs. That's what, you know, when the Navy and Marines deploy in the Mediterranean, they're aboard ARGs. And the Suez Canal is a major uh, method of entry in and out of the Indian Ocean and the Persian Gulf. So therefore, um, you know, if they have to go all the way, going around the Horn of Africa is very uh, dangerous. There's a lot of moving water there. The seas are, are, are can be much rougher and it, it's dangerous for shipping as, as well as the fact that you know, you, you have to go all the way around the continent of Africa. So um, I just, I, I find it interesting that it happened in the way it did and how it did. So be curious to see what comes out of those investigations, because most certainly there's going to be an investigation. Um, so at, at the moment right now, it's an inconvenience for a lot of people, because I think uh, in the news, they said that there's something to the neighborhood to the tune of $10 billion of day a day is being impacted for as long as the Suez is uh, closed down. So that's that's a lot of money. Um, so there, there's going to be a, a ripple effect uh, to that. I, I'm trying to look up. Somebody was asking where did it come from. I'm, I'm trying to find that. I. Sucking uh, in Egyptian city. I haven't, I haven't seen a whole lot of probably find where it's flagged at um the ship's owner showy keeson spelled 
S H O E I space K I S E N. So if Let's it's a, if it's an MV ship, it may be a Maersk ship. That's predominantly who uh, does that type of shipping. However, um, it, it just it really depends on where's the ship flagged out of. It's really weird to me that that's not like one of the first things that people write in the articles. <laughs> where it's coming from what it's carrying um okay here we go taiwan uh well it says it's operated by evergreen marine of taiwan right so that's that's who uh that's where it's probably flagged out of then it's a taiwanese ship the or panama panama, panama flag. flag the there panama fl what does that mean it's going to panama it's just flagged out of panama Ever Given was built in 2018 and is operated by Evergreen Marine of Taiwan. We used to see Evergreen containers all the time, or ships, maybe ships and containers. So I reckon in it's Seattle. A... That's all it says. Yeah. So it's it's Evergreen owned ship, uh, flagged out of uh, Pan Panama, owned in Taiwan, and that's that's uh, it's, I mean, you have ships flagged from all over the world. Uh, going through this stuff so <laughs> look at this one <laughs> i'm sure the canal blocked is somehow trump's fault are we still talking about that guy isn't he like no longer relevant according to... maybe that's know. what the problem he... is i was listening to your to the beginning part of your your uh vlog <laughs> Yeah, well, I I haven't I heard he's and he is announcing his own social media platform or something like that. Um, oh, Rosby, uh, is that a Salt Lake City shirt? No, this is actually this is my company SLC Squared, so Six Layer Concepts and Consulting. Yeah, it's a common thing people uh, conclusion they come from looking at that. But I teach human terrain mapping, behavior pattern recognition, so we we teach. Uh, that the utilization of human behavior with advanced critical thinking and decision making teach cops military and security first responders how to be more effective with decision making and open up opportunities for de-escalation mitigation through the through their uh work um so that's kind of that's kind of what the what that's all about so I just came back from St. Louis. I was teaching, uh, giving presentations at the ILEDA conference, which is a yearly conference that goes there, and that's the International Law Enforcement Educators and Trainers Association. So, mm. um, please interview James Corbett, Whitney Webb, and our Derek Bros. I have literally reached out to all three of those people in recent days. Corbett got back to me. He said he is available in May. So stay tuned for that. Um, I used a form email thing for Whitney uh, for another site she writes for and also did ask Ryan if he would drop my name and see if she would, but I have not heard back. Derek, I wrote on Twitter. I messaged him on Twitter, also have not heard back. I did that yesterday because he just had a new article come out talking about safe cities, or it's not safe cities, um, smart cities. Which was really interesting because I think maybe some of you guys saw the video I did about the Nevada, uh, was it the Innovation Zone? Like how the these technology companies are going to basically become their own governments. And I wish I had read his article when I, you know, before I did, I mean, obviously he just came out with it, so I couldn't have because I did that a while ago. But, you know, here I am thinking that the you know most nefarious thing is okay now you're gonna have a tech government you know what could go wrong but but um <laughs> he wrote a whole, whole article about how this is all you know these smart cities and innovation zone zones are essentially planned um planned to continue um mining data from us uh increasing a security state uh way of living here so you know nothing to see there but um i did want to talk to him about it so hopefully i don't know if you guys tweet him or something uh let him know i'm trying to get a hold of him but i did write to i have tried to read reach out to all of them there's there's um, one question on here that i thought was pretty relevant at least to the article if i can find it okay there you go uh bill van rom i hope i said that right how much of fault is divided up between the pilot and the captain at the, at the end of the day that the captain has the ultimate responsibility for what happens or fails to happen on the ship. So, uh, 
it's it is such a difficult thing there there are a lot of things that can go wrong when it comes to shipping and moving something that colossal around uh the pilots do take control of the, of the ship uh w once they're piloting it uh depending on the location and they're moving it around but the, but the captain still has ultimate responsibility to m make sure that it, it's being um uh, appropriately uh, the operation is being appropriate done. I mean, a good example of that is what the fallout from the Exxon Valdez. So, there's uh, something under where you just were. Yeah, it's right. Oh, um, Rich, sorry, I'm trying to find your other one. You said your wife died last year, and she was only 36. I'm really sorry to hear about that. Um, obviously, you know we're lucky we're both still here but you know we lost our our pup um and you know like I, a lot of people have reached out and talked to us about their stories of grief and whatnot so I'm, I'm sorry to hear that and i really am grateful for everybody who's who's sent stories of you know how you've gotten through some of these really um tough losses and that's one of the things i really like about these communities is that people are you know um i think obviously there are people who say negative things but there are a lot of people who try to support each other too and um that's one of the great things about the internet that you can find find that so anyway let me know if there's anything i can do um and uh mike bruno says nothing i'm assuming that is in regards to what could go wrong um yeah sure nothing i'm sure nothing could go wrong but thanks for the super chat um i will use that to uh buy a vpn so that they can't track my they can't track my um use of the internet <laughs> when i move to an innovation zone um Let's see here. <laughs> D does your husband everyday carry a roll in special? Uh, my my everyday carry. I don't I don't think it's it really matters. Uh, that stuff's a personal oh. thing, anyways. Um, but uh, I I think the the first part to understanding any kind of uh, it starts here with the mind with decision making. So, but uh, I am a fan of the of the uh, sig. 365 and i do like the the glock 43s uh glock 19s and always will be a 1911 fan because that's what i shot when i was in the marine corps uh courtney grace writes can we get part two of lynn's mass shooting discussion from the last news with booze um hmm. we might save that for another one yeah, since we've we'll already to... gone over an hour <laughs> yeah because to get Lynn starting to talk about that and oh yeah no I'll another. start I mean we appreciate that Courtney but that <laughs> that's a rabbit I'm, I'm hole I'm gonna get lunch if Lynn starts talking about that topic um <laughs> but we'll make sure how about this we promise you within the next week we will revisit that topic how does that sound and maybe we'll make it one of my exclusive videos since Courtney is over on locals um maybe we'll make it one of those exclusive videos or at least half of it or something like that so is it possible to hack a ship's GPS navigation system? I suppose anything's possible, uh, but there's a lot of redundance, redundancy in, in systems uh, aboard a ship. So you have like GMDSS systems, you have Furuno radar systems, you have depth sounding systems. I mean, it's just for that, I, I'm, I'm still, you know, for me, there is a lot to have to have gone wrong for, for that to occur. Um, so at any rate, like I said, I, I know some of you in the, in the chats are like, yeah, we'll never know the truth and, you know, enter the fake news and so on and so forth. But we may not, we, we may not, but it, whatever they do put out, if it doesn't have any, any reasonable, um, if it's not even the least bit reasonable, I, I, I think it, I don't know. I will I, say I this. I think folks are a lot, a lot less, um, I don't know if it's tough or you know, major intelligence agencies of certain countries to hide things. But um, but uh, I do believe that people are becoming much more skeptical of narratives in today's world, and it's harder. It's harder to uh, just get away with the, met with the um, you know, the, the sort of mainstream narrative, I guess, that would have sold 10 or 10 or 15 years ago is not, not selling anymore. So... So Dale writes, the Egyptian government supplies captains to the ships when they transit the Suez and they hand back over for when they are cleared of it. This is true. That in Essentially, those are what's also called pilots. So you can either have a pilot ship or you can have a pilot who comes aboard the ship and helps out. With U.S. military ships, 
that that doesn't uh, necessarily happen that way. Um, but the point is, is the captain is still responsible for what happens on the ship. So it's more of a hand in hand working effort. Uh, of course, the the Egyptian supplied pilots that that come on the ship, they're they're there with the specific reason that they know the ins and outs of the canal and how to transit it, which once again uh, begs to ask the question, how on earth did this happen? Um, so uh, that's a good point. Thank you, Dale, for bringing that up. You're absolutely right. Um, go scroll up. Hey, Courtney had another question that here. Um, eh. Yeah, I don't think I was... It was down here. Sorry, looking for right there. Oh, there you go. Do, does the redundancies include redundant sensor mechanisms? Yeah. So it, the redundancies that uh, work on ships. So you have also port and starboard redundancies on ships. So even just like the passageways, like if something were to happen on the on the starboard or or the right side of the ship, um, there's a way to get to it from the port side. So that's just one example. They're, they always go by the two is one, one is none type of mentality on ships. And even like when we would do uh, VBSS missions for ships, a lot of times we wouldn't have to take the bridge um, j just to get regain control of the ship. You can actually retake uh, the wheelhouse. Uh, you can take engineering. So the ships can actually be controlled and maneuvered fr not from the bridge, actually down, down in... Uh, aft engineering so uh the point is is like yes there's a lot of redundancies there and it goes back to in my brain like well what 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 type of catastrophic uh failure occurred um f for that to happen okay thank you mclean blades for the super chat thanks for the suez insight today lynn you can yeah. go use that for a beer uh allison can you visit the border sure i'd love to do that but which border? Which one? We're, I can drive to Canada, to Canada right now. <laughs> I can show you all of the Canadians in cages. Do we do that up here? I don't know. <laughs> I don't know if they'll let. Maybe they probably let me see. Canadians are all like eating pancakes or something, you know, with um. Oh, don't maple hit, syrup. hit! Don't mind me. Um, it's right. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. The captain claims high winds caused a sandstorm, which created visibility problems. Yeah, um, again, there's there's plenty of points and parts along the Suez where if a ship needs to stop, they'll stop. Um, so I don't know. I I feel like that's just an excuse. Uh, <laughs> I I there's been times when when transiting the Suez where we've there there's a couple areas where you you can stop in the Suez, and it will um, give you the ability to kind of make make anchor. Uh, it, it, usually there's like some kind of backlog or something like that. Um, I mean, you can see it on the map if we had when we had prepared, we could pull it up. But it's what's interesting about where that ship is blocking the canal. There's just above it. There's like a waiting area where there's there's a large open water area just to the north of where that ship is blocked, and that's also exactly the spot where it goes from two canals. Then there's that waiting area, and then there's the last little bit of the Suez where there's that one, it's just one canal, one way in, one way out. So, um, it's, it's, I uh, think we should wrap. I think our daughter's probably going to be up soon. And, uh, um, you want to take one other question? Yeah, we'll see. We'll see what that is. Um, I think that's, I think we could leave it on that point right there. I mean, that's a good point. It's either, Catastrophic. <laughs> we in the military we called it a, a, a class one alpha mishap, or it, it was deliberate, and so then it may take some time to to you know figure that out. And the visible array says it it takes some doing to to block the Suez. It it is very wide. Yeah, it's it's certainly wide enough that that it sh that should not have happened. Um, and even with as big as that ship is, it would have to be a lot of wind. To, to to affect that so um writing down some interview names for possible stories yeah um 
I know we were talking about eucalyptus trees earlier, so I have that written down too. I'll look into that. Um, would love to hear you. I would love to hear you guys rap. <laughs> no, you wouldn't. What song do you want us to rap? <laughs> I could do it. was a good day, but this might get flagged and demonetized just because of some yeah, of the Lynn Yeah, Lynn, is that Ice Cube? Yeah, that's like Lynn my always one. says in his class that life is like, or like my man Ice Cube says, yeah. I can live live another 24 Waking up in the morning, gotta thank God. I don't know, but today seems kind of odd. No barking from the dog, no smog. Mama cooked a breakfast with no hog. Yeah. Thinking, well, I, it, as I walk out the door, thinking, well, I hit another 24. It's, to me, that's pretty poignant because he's saying, okay, is that 24 minutes, 24 hours, 24 days, 24 years? 